The Rifle, Patrick F. McManus. At least once a week from the fifth grade on, I made it a practice to stop by Clyde Fitch's sports shop after school. Clyde was always glad to see me, and we would josh each other. Hi, Clyde, I'd say as I came through the door. Don't handle the guns, Clyde would say. Yeah, there's a chill in the air, I'd respond. Folks say it's going to be an early winter. You got peanut butter on one of the 12 gauges last time. I wish you would find someplace else to eat your after-school snack. I would respond appreciatively at Clyde's sharp wit and mark up a score for him in the air. Then as he turned to wait on a customer, I would hear a soft, sweet song beckon me to the gun racks. It would be the rifles and shotguns singing to me. You drive me to distraction when you work my lever action, sang a 30-30. When you give my stock a nuzzle, you send chills down my muzzle, trill the 270. I lie awake at nights after you pit down my sides, moaned a 30-odd six. I'll admit they weren't great lyricists, but they had nice voices and the melody was pleasant. Before I knew what was happening, a 30-odd six would have leapt into my hands and I would be checking its action. Don't touch the guns, Clyde Fitch would yell, doing a fair impression of an enraged businessman. Good one, Clyde, good one, I would say as I set the rifle back in the rack and peered down at a sleek, inviting 300. Apparently displeased by my lack of enthusiasm for his performance, Clyde would rush over, grab me by the back of my coat and collar and belt, and rush me out the door of his establishment. We kidded around with each other like that for about four years, occasionally working on new bits of dialogue, but with Clyde always opening up with his favorite line, Don't touch the guns. I suppose the reason he liked it so much was that it always got a laugh. Just a few days short of eternity, my 14th birthday finally arrived. I had expected it to come bearing as a gift one thirty thirty rifle, about which I had dropped approximately 30,000 hints to my family. No rifle. I could tell from the shapes of the packages. They were all shaped like school clothes. Something seems to be missing here, I said, nervously ripping open a package of jockey shorts. You sure you didn't forget my present in the closet? No, my mom said. That's the whole kit and caboodle of them right there. I was a sort of expecting a 30-30 rifle. Oh, Mom said. Well, if you want a rifle, you'll just have to get yourself a job and earn enough money to buy one. It was not unusual in those days for parents to say such brutal things like that to their children. There were no laws back then to prevent parents from saying no, and worse yet, meaning no. Life was hard for a kid. Still, I couldn't believe that my mother was actually suggesting that her only son go and find a job. Surely you're jesting, I said. No. Naturally, I'd heard about work. My family was always talking about it within range of my hearing, and so far as I could tell seemed generally to be in favor of it. I didn't know why. Nothing I ever heard about work made it seem very appealing. My old friend Rancid Crabtree had told me that he had tried work once as a young man. He said that he was supposed to cut down trees for the man who had hired him, but when he picked up the axe and started to chop, his whole life passed before him. He gave up work then and there. He said that he knew some folks loved to work and that was fine, but that he himself couldn't stand even to be near it. Of the two opinions about work, I favored Rancid's. Still. If I wanted to hunt deer that coming fall, I would need a rifle. On the other hand, if I got a job, that would ruin my summer and leave me only mornings and evenings and weekends to fish. At best, I might be able to get in some more fishing on days I was too sick to work. I weighed my need for the rifle against a ruined summer and after much long and painful thought arrived at a distasteful decision, I would have to borrow a rifle. Then as now, people did not stand in line to loan out their rifles to beginning hunters, or to anyone else for that matter. Rancid Crabtree seemed to me to be the best prospect for the loan of a rifle. By the way, Rancid, I said to him casually one day,
How about loaning me your thirty thirty for deer season this year? Rancid's face erupted into that beautiful snaggle tooth grin of his. That's a good one, he said. Make it up yourself or somebody tell it to you. It's no joke, I said. I need a deer rifle and I don't see why you can't loan me your thirty thirty. Well, I would loan it to you except for one thing. And that's, I don't want to. Rancid had only two defects to his character. He had never learned the art of mincing words and you could never talk him into doing something he didn't want to do. I shook my head in despair. You're the only person I can think of, Rancid, who might loan me a rifle. I guess the only thing left for me to do is to go get a job and earn some money. Now, don't go talking like that, Rancid said. As soon as you got recovered from the shop, a few fella like you got everything to live for. Talking about getting a j j j j Throwing away his life. Now, no sir, won't stand for it. Now, here's what you do. You go ask the engine if you can borrow one of his rifles. Pinto Jack? Why, sure, Pinto's give you the hide off in his scrawny carcass if it had a zipper on it. I found Pinto Jack puffing on a pipe on the front porch of his cabin and put my request to him straight away. Pinto Jack smiled only on rare occasions, and this was not one of them. You want to borrow my rifle? He said, studying me thoughtfully through a cloud of pipe smoke. If I loaned you my rifle, what would I use when I raided the ranchers and burned their buildings and drove off their livestock and like that? Couldn't you use a bow and arrow for a few raids, I said. Now you tell me, how am I going to drive my old truck and shoot a bow and arrow at the same time? No, I got to have my rifle for raiding the ranchers. I looked crestfallen, having many years before learned that this was one of the best looks to use on Pinto Jack. Tell you what, he said after a moment, I could maybe let you use the old rifle my father brought back from the Great War. First world? Little Bighorn. It's a single shot and kicks a bit, but you're welcome to it. I rushed home lugging the monstrous firearm, pinned a target to a fence post backed by a sand bank, paced off a hundred yards, drew a bead on the target and gently squeezed the trigger. Later I heard that all the livestock within a mile radius sprang two feet into the air and went darting about in all directions at that altitude. Apples rained down out of the trees in the orchards. Three lumberjacks swore off drink and two atheists were converted to religion. My own interpretation of the event was that I had just been struck by lightning, a meteorite, or a bomb. When my vision cleared, I knew I was in trouble. Not only would my folks be upset by my shooting one of their fence posts in half, but the neighbors would be mad at me for destroying their sandbank. Nevertheless, I decided to try one more shot, this one left-handed. The second shot went off a little better since by now I knew what to expect. It was easier for me to keep my nose out of the way too because the first shot had moved it up into the vacant area above my right eye where it would be safe. By the time I had finished sighting in the rifle, I figured I'd be the only kid in the school talent show who could applaud behind his back with his shoulder blades. My first deer managed to elude me that year. Even though I had opportunities for several good shots, by the time I had grimaced enough to pull the trigger, the deer was always gone. At the end of the season, I returned the rifle to Pinto Jack. Any luck, he said. Nope. Well, don't feel so bad about it. Come on in and have yourself an orange pop, and I'll show you how I can applaud with my shoulder blades. Bet you don't know anybody who can do that. By the time next summer rolled around, it had been apparent to me that the only way I was ever going to get a deer rifle was to earn the money for it. There was a dairy, farm, dairy farmer by the name of Brown who lived nearby and whose reputation in the community was that of a kindly, if somewhat frugal, gentleman. Out of desperation for a deer rifle, I broke down and indentured myself to him at the rate of 50 cents an hour manufacturing post holes. Mr. Brown gave me the job after asking if I thought I could do a man's work. My ingenious reply was, it depends on the man. 
The farmer said later that he supposed the particular man I had been referring to was an Egyptian mummy. For all his other drawbacks, Mr. Brown did not lack a sense of humor. About his other drawbacks, it was only after going to work for him that I discovered that he wasn't a kindly gentleman at all, but the former commandant of a slave labor camp. Our mutual misfortune was that he had somehow missed the last boat to Brazil and had been forced to escape to Idaho, where he took up dairy farming as a cover. Burk, burk, he screamed at me, slapping the leg of his biv overalls with a swagger stick. Make thy postals, make thy postals, faster, faster. And I would streak about the landscape, trailing fresh dug post holes. Sometimes after glancing nervously around, I would step behind a tree to catch my breath. The farmer would drop out of the branches and screech at me. But you do to think I not pay you 50 cents an hour to breathe. Verk, verk. At day's end, my mother would drive over to the farm to give me a ride home. She and the farmer would chat about my capacity for hard labor. I'm surprised you can get any work out of him at all, Mom would say. The old farmer would laugh in his kindly way. Actually, I'd found him to be a bit slow, but he's doing better. Just today, while he was digging a post hole, I thought I detected some motion in one of his arms. Then he would give me a pat on my sagging, quivering back. Off you go now, lad. See you bright and early in the morning. Odd, I thought. He seems to have lost his accent. Bright and early the next morning, the farmer would tell me, Verk, verk, lazy dumb cough, make thy postals faster, faster. At the end of the very hour in which I earned the last fifty cents I needed to buy the rifle, I resigned my position. When I told the farmer I was quitting, he tried to conceal his disappointment by leaping in the air and clicking his heels. There are few things, by the way, more disgusting than a dairy farmer clicking his heels in the air. I'll say this for you, he told me. You have dug what I regard to be the most expensive post holes in the whole history of agriculture. If it was possible, I would gather them all up and put them in a bank vault, rather than leave them scattered randomly about my property. Nevertheless, lad, should you ever find yourself in need of a job to buy yourself, say, a shotgun, why you just come to me, I'll be happy to recommend you as a worker to my neighbor, Ferguson who, though I may say a harsh word about him now and again, is not a bad sort at all, particularly a man, for a man who is stupid and greedy and probably a thief. Naturally, I was flattered by this little farewell speech. I even changed my mind about his being a former commandant of a slave labor camp. Thanks, I told him, but now that I've tried work and found it to be about what I expected, I think I'll avoid it in the future. Mr. Brown said he thought that, he, that that would be a good idea, and that as far as he had observed, I had considerable talent for that line of endeavor and was practically assured of success. The very next day, with money for the rifle wadded in the pocket of my jeans, I sauntered into Clyde Fitch's sport shop. Hi, Clyde, I said. Don't touch the guns, Clyde shouted. I took out my wad of money and began to unfold it. Seriously, though, my boy, I was just asking myself why old Pat hadn't been in lately to fondle the guns. Yes, indeed. Now, good buddy, I'll be much obliged if you would try out the action on this new thirty thirty and give me your expert opinion of it. The end.